Hi, I'm here today with John Blair. John is a cyber governance and information technology expert. He's on the show here today with me to talk a little bit about securing your data in the cloud. Thanks for being on the show again, John. Hi, Lee. Good to be back. Thank you. So we're talking about cloud cyber risk. Uh, what, what do organizations need to be looking at to help secure their data in the cloud? I think first and foremost, the need to understand where is all the data um, and how do people get data in and out of their environment. Uh, there's a lot of things typically called shadow IT where certain departments or certain users might, you know, for example, start sending things to Dropbox to sync data amongst themselves to make mm -hmm. it easier for themselves, but they might be syncing confidential information that's now in Dropbox and the, the organization has no idea about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that scenario plays itself out over and over and over again, where there might be departments that actually use applications in the cloud that thus obviously are processing data as well that the organization might not know about either. So you need to get an inventory of data, where is it uh, from a holistic point of view. And uh, today with, you have the bring your own cloud, known yeah. as BYOC. <laughs> yep. Many employees are bringing various apps with them that they're used to using from their prior employers, and right. they're wanting to use these apps. Sometimes they're putting them on their smartphones and whatnot. Yep. And that's, that's driving a lot of the corporate action towards that. Um, the cloud, for, first and foremost, is, is uh, a cost savings for the most part, but what people are not realizing is that along with those savings come certain responsibilities. Um, and, and from a user perspective, you know, people are used to, like you said, people are used to certain applications, they're used to certain things on their phone or on a tablet, or they're used to working in a certain way mm -hmm. with certain applications. And then you get in a corporate environment and those applications or that way of working might not be available. Uh, and so people start voicing that and it becomes you know, somewhat of a problem for corporate to adapt and keep up. Yeah, so organizations, especially healthcare related organizations as well as financial services and other organizations that depend on intellectual property have a real risk here, don't they, with they a, people they bringing a, apps? They have a very big risk. Um, both of those sectors are heavily regulated. Uh, data needs to be very tightly controlled. Uh, breach notifications in the event that it happens become mm -hmm. a very big deal, very public. Um, and if you can't explain uh, where the data is and where, you know, uh, who has it, then you have a problem. Mm -hmm. So isn't there also a risk not only of theft or dissemination of intellectual property and trade secrets, but what if the, the information becomes compromised by malware or a hacker to, to morph the data or destroy the data? Yeah, that, then that becomes your, your only your only recourse at that point is to have really, really good backups um, mm -hmm. because otherwise you have no actionable uh, direction to take. Um, if you don't have a backup of that data, um, you, you know you have you have no ability to recover. Um, it still might be considered a breach a lot mm -hmm. of times in certain organizations or certain regulations. Mm -hmm. um, so you still might have to report it even though the data has never left your organization. Yeah. The fact you've lost control of it might be considered a breach. Um, so that might be something you'd have to consider with your legal teams, but it's not, uh, it's still mm -hmm. a very big deal because you no longer are able to use it. So don't you have a risk though that if your backup is online that the, the attacker could compromise your primary source and then your, your backup drive attached to your server? Well, hopefully, hopefully they haven't gotten that far, um, but if generally speaking, your backups are always in a separate physical location. Um, and so not necessarily on the off. network and their, their separate you know, media and things like that. But uh, yeah, if you've, gotten, if you've gotten to the point where they've, they've corrupted your database, they've encrypted your database, and they've also encrypted or destroyed your backups, um, you're, you're in a very bad way. <laughs> yes. So knowing that drive, hard drives sometimes fail, if you're using a physical hard drive to write the data to, what do you think most organizations should be doing to ensure they have a certain number of versions that they can restore to? Well, normally backup um, systems are version controlled, and so you do backups based on frequency. You do daily, you do hourly, you do you know mm -hmm. um, on the spot. Uh, so there are point in time. A lot of times, there's a lot people organizations that can afford it have um, 
uh, failover data centers, for example, that mm -hmm. are mimicking the primary data center, so mm -hmm. there is no loss of processing, uh, but that's very, very expensive to do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you should definitely have uh, you know, off-site storage of data, but those, those are all historical. Um, and things that are not necessarily online that you mm -hmm. can immediately refer to those less that are compromised to your point. So when you're considering bringing in a cloud provider to your organization as a, an official non-shadowware <laughs> operation, what are some of the questions you ask of your vendors and things that you look for to help secure, ensure those cloud providers are secure? Right. Um, first and foremost, are they, do they have some sort of attestations um, with respect to the services you're going to use for those that provider. Um, cloud providers have hundreds and hundreds of services. Mm -hmm. um, not all of them are audited by an independent auditor. Um, not that that guarantees anything, but it, at least if it's the services you're going to use or the applications you're going to use, uh, the locations you're going to use of that cloud provider, then, then you have something to point to to say, you know, mm -hmm. we did our due diligence and they, they have these SOC 2s, whatever the form it might take. Um, but you, you have to do something on them to ensure mm -hmm. that because the cloud is half their responsibility and half of yours. Mm -hmm. um, and you have, to, you have to make sure they're doing their half. So what other things do you th think that organizations should look for if they're using data in the, the cloud, how to maximize the security of that data? First and foremost, I think they need to take, they need to, within their own organization, block these, these drop boxes and, and the Google Drives and all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff like that so that people individually can't make, uh, you know, downloads, for example, from the database mm -hmm. and then upload it to Dropbox or Google Drive mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, and then go home and look at the same documents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from a personal perspective, that's very convenient. It's very nice to have to be able to sync, and you know, you can use one one central source of the information. But from a corporate perspective, no. that isn't that isn't your data. It's the corporation's data, and so you know, the corporation needs to be responsible and know where that data is going and and how to prevent it, ideally, from from getting there. Um, it's very mm -hmm. easy to drop you know, to block Dropbox at a network level, um, you know, but the problem is that there's hundreds of those types of things yeah. to block. And so, you know, you need, to, you need to do a lot more care from a corporate perspective internally to make sure that your users aren't, aren't putting data someplace where mm -hmm. you, you lose control of it. And are there any, any other things that you'd recommend adopting if you're going to use these cloud platforms to help ensure that hackers don't get access to user accounts. <laughs> um, that's that's an interesting one um, because Azure has been, uh, you know, almost all those user accounts have been hacked at one point or another, and so the only thing protecting them at this point is a password. Um, I think multi-factors and and um, you know bio bio authentication type of uh, actions are the only thing you can do to improve your yeah. chances of those accounts not being used uh, by, by inappropriate people. Yeah. Because the accounts themselves are basically public knowledge. Yeah. You know, your, your, you know, your username in, is, is public knowledge, the only thing protecting it's a password. And, and so, you know, the multi-factor authentication actually addresses and requires that you have two or three factors. Um, something you know, something you are, or something you have. Right. So for instance, many people know their password, uh, they might have a, a thumbprint, or they might have uh, their cell phone right, really. that is something that they have. So right. you know, having that second factor makes it less likely that someone can simply get the password and get in. Right, where they send, like to your, the, your point, the phone, they send a code to your phone, you enter the code into the application, exactly. then, then, then you gain access. Until then, you're, you're simply yeah. at the network border. So on our next video, we're going to be talking a little bit more about, again, about cloud cyber risk security. And specifically, we'll talk about some of the legal and compliance issues that arise. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Lee. My pleasure.